Great, thank you very much. I realize I didn't make the introduction easy because uh, I'm coming from a Norwegian institution, speaking on an American accident, and uh, with my co-authors, I'm the only non-Norwegian. And I'm speaking with an American accent, but I don't come from America either, so <laughs> you, you did a great job. Thank you. But uh, I wanted to, uh, to, to talk about this, this accident. It was a case study that, that uh, our institutions used to bring together several projects that we have ongoing on digitalization. And I almost feel like this is a bit of a Monty Python skit because this is something different I'm bringing to you now, completely different, um, because I come from a human factors background. Um, so, uh, so I work a lot with the SDCW, I work a lot with training seafarers, and the crossover is that I work on user-centered design. So it's that real, I mean, if, if I have to have some kind, of, uh, some kind of analogy, it's like the crossover between Solus and STCW. So fitting design for the end users. Um, so much of my work is involved in that. I'll, of course, acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Shetel Norby, Stig Ole Jonsson, and uh, Froy Berth Bjornsson. Bjorn Seth uh, at uh, the respective institutions. And uh, it brings together two, two projects that I mentioned, one that I'm intimately involved in as a, as a user tester, and that is uh, Open Bridge. And it's a joint industry project that's looking at uh, unifying bridge systems. And I'll give you a little bit of background on some of the issues we face today um, and some of the problems that are also attached to the John S. McCain accident. Most of my work's in the, the Merchant Navy and, uh, and is not naval, but it's, I can't say it's refreshing, but it's interesting to see an issue on the naval side that parallels issues that we certainly deal with uh, in my line of work. I mentioned it was a joint industry project. Uh, we currently now have 25 uh, industry stakeholders and classification societies. And uh, one of the, our outputs from the project is, a, um, what would you call it, a design guideline for interfaces, which as of this morning just got voted by our, our board to be released publicly. So it will be um, publicly available for you if you're interested. Contact me or talk to me afterwards and I can show you the, the online uh, portal. Second part of the project is run by Sintef, and it's a, a separate project, I should say, called SMACS. And it's, it's really about attaching kind of user needs to the design process, the ship design process. Obviously, uh, I'm talking about the John S. McCain, and I think it's a well-publicized accident that I'm sure all of you are familiar with, uh, with the tanker in the Strait of Singapore. Uh, a little bit of a background, and I, I recognize I might be speaking a little bit of a different language than you here today. Uh, I will look at it from a social technical perspective, just as the accident report does, actually. Um, meaning that there's a combination of factors. We're talking about the person, the human factor, but that, sits, that person sits within a larger social and technical system, whether we're talking about you know, the interaction with technology, the interaction with the physical environment, internal and external to the ship, uh, the different processes, the different organization, rules, regulations, uh, the society and culture around that. Complex, dynamic, tightly coupled interactions. And this is really um, an area that developed in modern terms out of World War II in the aviation industry where systems became more complex, more automated, and people had to interact with them. People, technology, interactions. So one of my goals in my, uh, my research area is to optimize through design. Now, you're all engineers, you're marine engineers, you're designers, naval architects, whatever your background is, you're designing systems. One of the things that I want you to walk away here today, uh, not that you don't know it, is that the person is part of your system too. And, uh, and that's certainly where human factors comes into it. So very simplified, human technology organization, there's an interaction. You see this in, uh, here's a, a, a medical journal talking about this social technical system. Uh, I think it's to do with uh, e-prescription e services. So there's tasks, there's technologies, there's people, there's organizations, there's technical subsystems. Same goes on the, uh, more on the business side, which is certainly outside my area of expertise. There's goals, there's people, there's infrastructure, technology, organization, policy, blah, 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 blah. So we're talking about complex interactions. From a navigation perspective, from a user perspective, what we train and what every navigational uh, institution um, trains is hard skills. So these technical skills of how do you use specific pieces of equipment. 
Um, and the soft skills as well. You might have heard of them called non-technical skills or bridge resource management, engine room resource management. That also developed out of the aviation industry with something called cockpit resource management. We teach a lot on this within our simulators, uh, with our students and our professionals with reoccurring, um, with reoccurring uh, training. And that's the social aspects, the leadership, the communication, the problem solving, um, which is, of course, integrated with these harder technical skills. <laughs> Where this leads to design is that if we take the bridge, at least, uh, the crew has to manage and interact with different systems. And in these days, particularly combinations of digital and physical interfaces. There's been several studies and case studies done on the brands or the number of companies or the numbers of pieces of equipment that are on board a single bridge. And it's in the area on a typical uh, merchant ship, 25, 30 is not uncommon. Something called a multi-vendor bridge system perhaps you've heard of. And that's all well and good, except when you take a look at these interfaces. And if you're dealing with 20, 25, whatever companies, pieces of equipment, and they have their individual design philosophies, color schemes, patterns, layouts, even simple interactions with uh, menu items. I mean, think about switching back and forth between Microsoft and Apple products, and then extrapolate that. So this is not John S. McCain. This is a contrast isn't so good. Um, this is of a recent field study I was on. This is the kind of system we're dealing with. Uh, here we have a technology ranging from the 1950s up until their latest software update of the navigation system from 2017. So quite a long time period, analog and digital interfaces, and a hell of a lot of different types of designs. Even if I simplify that and take the bridge wing, we're, dealing, we're still dealing with 10 to 12 different pieces of uh, uh, individual um, equipment slash interfaces, varying pieces of design, and it, it can be difficult to manage. <clears throat> it's a central principle in usability, user experience research, for design consistency. Reduces errors, increases efficiency, increases user satisfaction, increases trust in systems. Again, here I'm using the bridge as the case study. Just think about your normal PC. Think about your normal smartphone. Think about your interfaces with your car system or your stereo system. It's the same um, methods, philosophies, purpose. So if we're talking about the spaghetti mess of the bridge example that I showed you, uh, this, the, the, the navigation crew has to manage this. Again, these different philosophies, styles, specifications, colors, layouts. It increases the cognitive demands and already a cognitively demanding um, operation. I wanted to give you an example. This came from a recent paper published uh, last year uh, by, by us, and it's the simplest example I could find. And it's five examples of a very binary on-off selection switch that we took from, from the field. And we tried to make it a bit generic to make it a little bit easier to understand. And again, this is a zero or one problem, on or off, light switch on or off. And we have these different design examples, slide, horizontal, vertical, different buttons, now there's labels, uh, different colors involved, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, all you have to do is take this very simple example and then scale it up to the entire bridge and all the systems involved in it. And you can imagine that there's issues with integration of different pieces of equipment. So if I bring this kind of background knowledge to the accident, uh, we will be discussing uh, John S. McCain and the, uh, the, the Alnick MC um, collision in 2017. But in particular, what is the motivation for this paper was the announcement made in August of 2019 of the, uh, I don't want to call it de-digitalization, but there was an announcement made about, uh, by the US Navy about taking off some of the uh, digital aspects of these interfaces, which is quite interesting and connects back to the re ongoing research projects that myself and my team are working on. Uh, so we talk about digitalization, certainly automation, and that factor of the, uh, involved in this incident, and, uh, and also this relationship between physical and digital interfaces and, uh, and uh, inputs and outputs. I myself have, ha have a disclaimer, of course. Uh, we're talking about a, a highly public accident involving uh, a Navy, and uh, what it's based on are these three documents. 
uh, and some uh, some media reports of interviews and things with the U.S. Uh, Navy personnel, and it's based on the Singapore uh, Transport Ministry of Transport uh, uh, publicly available documents, uh, Fleet Forces Command uh, review published in 2017, both, and then the public National Transport Safety Board um, accident report. So it's very difficult to give you an accident synopsis because, of course, this is highly complex. So I give you minimal details on purpose, and be aware of that. Uh, very bullet point synopsis, destroyer was overtaking the tanker, uh, sailing southwesterly in the Strait of Singapore, uh, traveling at about 18 knots with, with, as you can imagine, Strait of Singapore, of course, other vessels around. Uh, the crew of the destroyer perceived a loss of steering, uh, and trying, while trying to fix this perceived loss, key, key point there is a perceived loss of steering, uh, it took a, a, a quite a quite a brash port turn and uh, collided with the Almec. Outcomes: ten crew died on the destroyer, forty-eight injured, one hundred million, approximately in damages. Tanker no injuries and a quarter of a million dollars in damages. And I think that alone is is quite amazing, quite interesting in and of itself. Yeah, I thought this would happen. So again, if you're not familiar, I think this illustrates it better than any kind of uh, text I can give you. This is the synopsis of the last three minutes, as, as the title shows. On the below, John S. McCain. Quite a high rate of turn, quite a high speed. So when I showed that first photo and I show these, I, I, I know based on the presentations this morning, based on your background, you're licking your lips. You say, this guy's going to talk all about call strength and buoyancy <laughs> and all, all this stuff. <laughs> Uh, no, so I won't. I'll joke aside. Uh, what I want to talk about is yes, an aspect of this is the design of the interface itself, but actually, it's more in the design process. I'm not used to such a busy city like London. I just assume that's outside. Uh, it's more about the process, which I certainly think is of interest to everyone in this room, the design process as opposed to kind of the details of, you know, me geeking out on the interface design is not appropriate for today. So I want to bring that back to hopefully uh, allow you to make some stronger connections uh, to the accident from, from a human, human factors uh, perspective. So at lunch, I was talking about kind of the old view of accident report. In the old days, you'd say, well, it was a human error. The people on board, there's 14 on board that bridge at the time of collision. They're incompetent. Fire them. Get 14 new in, and uh, life is good. That's a very old perspective because the, uh, a new view on human error or a new view on uh, accidents and operations is, you know, it's, it's complex. It's that social technical system. There's organizational issues. There's training issues. There's design issues. There's policy perspective uh, issues. And think back to that the Septagon model I showed you. So an overview of the reports. Perceived loss of steering by the crew due to the helmsman unintentionally transferring control uh, from the helm station on board the bridge to the Lee helm station. Takeaway here is there's uh, multiple control stations, more than the, just those two, and it requires a transfer and an acceptance of control between them. Uh, they didn't know which one had uh, control. Uh, this ultimately misled the destroyer's bridge team, placing their focus on a perceived malfunction that actually didn't exist. There's nothing wrong with the steering gear. Uh, also, the port and starboard rub rudders weren't paired, so which is why you see this quite aggressive port turn. Mismatched throttles resulted in this uh, port turn. 
So contributory factors. Remember, it's not human error. They weren't incompetent. There's contributing factors that ultimately led to this uh, accident as, as uh, the majority of complex accidents in, uh, in the complex safety critical industries. Operational oversight. I'm not a Navy guy. That sounds like a very Navy kind of uh, statement. Uh, attributed to the following factors. Insufficient crew. Okay. Inadequate bridge operating procedures. Loss of crew situational awareness. Uh, poor equipment design, crew fatigue, happened at 5 a.m. In, in the morning. And, uh, and it was also a familiarization issue came out in these reports. These new digital systems interfaces were installed about a year to two years before the accident. And what came out of the report was that the crew weren't necessarily familiarized or trained in these new systems. And actually, it wasn't written into the operating procedures in uh, these digitized systems in question. And ultimately, uh, if I take a quote of, the, uh, of one of the findings, the design of uh, the McCain's touchscreen steering and thrust control system increased the likelihood, increased the likelihood of operator errors that led to the collision. So I can move through this. As I mentioned, this all happened in uh, 2017. What got me kind of reinterested in this case was an announcement by the US Navy in 2019 that made all sorts of headlines and Yes, in, in general media and in the maritime side of things, but also like tech journals. Wired was all over it for a while. Because the headline, maybe a bit, little bit misleading, is de-digitalization of systems. Which is misleading because it was related to him, two, two in particular. And uh, there were fleet-wide surveys done and the preference for physical controls on particular items over digital controls. So things like joysticks, things like buttons, things like levers. Uh, and here we go. Even if I just do a, a comparison between the, the interface of the, of the thruster on the, from the US Navy and kind of a typical, uh, typical thruster control, a physical thruster control on the market today. They communicate very, very clearly. Or I should say physical thruster controls uh, like joysticks can, can, can uh, communicate information very clearly. Um, and that was one of the contributory factors, or one of the, uh, one of the marks against this digital system. It hid information. As I mentioned, I want to talk about how did it come to this. Um, some, of the, some of the outcomes not designed to best practices, the poor layout colors consistency, did not follow human engineering guidelines including those approved by the, the US Navy, and lack HMI reviews. So a lot of my work is, is, uh, is structuring things we call workshops, where we have end users, seafarers, in the same room as naval architects. Maybe some of you have been a part of these. Maybe some of you haven't. But the purpose there is a knowledge transfer of experience of the users using the system and the people designing the system. Um, and one quote from a program executive officer was that the ships in these particular systems are, were overly complex. And again, if we come back to the cognitive demands, the cognitive loading on, uh, on the people using a system, we want to be able to reduce that as much as possible, not introduce um, unnecessary complexity. So one of the outcomes is the, I know, I think I've got about 10 minutes. Uh, poor processes, the poor processes, the systematic nature uh, led to this ultimately these poor interfaces. And the people responsible for delivering these new systems, as highlighted by the, uh, by the review, had a limited understanding of uh, human systems integration. And that's kind of the uphill ba battle that I've been fighting, sometimes versus people of your profession, sometimes not, of the importance of thinking about the human within the system. And uh, traditionally, te technology or engineering-centric uh, design, uh, spiral design processes, don't necessarily take that into account. And, uh, and I realize who my audience is here today. So some of the results from that SMAX project I just mentioned, um, systems do not support optimally uh, work <coughs> tasks. Again, using this as a case study as uh, illustrating that. And uh, this multi-modal, multi-stakeholder 
design team, including people with interaction and design skills, human factors, people kind of from my background, and users themselves, to be part of this design process with Naval Architects. And I know a lot of you are looking at me sideways thinking, well, that's not the way I'm educated. That's not the way the culture is within Naval Architecture. And I would say, yes, that's, that, you're absolutely right. And, uh, and part of uh, the projects that I've presented here and my ongoing work is this, this, uh, this integration, if you will, within Naval Architecture. And actually, you can expand it to engineering design practices in general. Uh, there's lots of great examples uh, I can provide you with crew making modifications to your designs or your colleagues' designs after they're put into operation uh, to overcome what they might say or might refer to as poor designs. Um, obviously, this is in an effort to increase efficiency, increase ease of use, and as we've shown and published about, can also uh, violate many rules and decrease the safety of the crew because they're thinking about making their job easier. But can we integrate this and use this knowledge into the design in the first place? That's, uh, that's really my motivation. We'll, we'll, again, not the John S. McCain, the field study I did last uh, in 2019. We have that uh, bridge control uh, uh, wing, uh, bridge wing control system. Now, this particular bridge had port, starboard, center, and aft control uh, stations. <laughs> tens of millions of dollars on this specialized vessel. And uh, their solution for knowing which station had control, was active, was to put ice cream containers, flip them upside down over the other stations so that they could visually see. I know they didn't have, they don't have the resources for 14 people on board the bridge. But this is a design solution they've implemented on their tens of millions of dollars worth of ship with however many hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars worth of fancy equipment on board. This is their solution after the fact, after they're given this amazing ship. Uh, and I just had to smile when I was reading through the uh, kind of the, the, the accident reports of the John S. McCain because this was a factor in, in, in this naval accident as well. Which station had control? Which station had active uh, inputs and outputs? This is how one uh, company or one ship solved the solution. So fighting back a little bit against the, um, the de-digitalization, it's not an either or decision. I was called a Luddite one time by a student by saying, oh, you're talking about putting back physical joysticks. And uh, part of this is that it was bad digital design, bad interface design. But I think there's some very good truth to the value of physical inputs. Uh, and that's certainly one of, the, uh, one of the, the purposes of the Open Bridge Project, is to look at the relationship between these different interfaces. Uh, looking at integrating, yeah, the, the, new digital, the new digital advancements, I can say, that will continue to happen and, and take the best properties of the physical. And as I mentioned, um, I can quickly go through this. As part of the project, working with the, the designers and my team, we're looking at uh, the integration of physical components and classifying physical components, classifying um, the digital components, and taking the best from both worlds, if you will. And uh, here's some, some snapshots, at least, of how, uh, how the, the now public uh, uh, design, design system uh, looks and how we break down different components to have a consistent design. Um, if we take a conning, for example, yeah, I guess this is open bridge. This yeah. is open bridge. Yeah, okay. this is open bridge. Uh, and at least applying some of our uh, our designs across different systems, our Echo Sound or Speed Log. Uh, yeah, something simple like uh, the navigation lights uh, interfaces, different palettes, and uh, the grand dream. I, I'm not sure quite how grand it is. This is very conceptual. We set up in one of our simulators. Uh, with all open bridge uh, applications. The fun thing now is some of our, uh, some of our uh, uh, industry partners are starting to roll out products um, with open bridge designs in them. So that's really exciting from a research, researcher side. I mean, I sit in my little room in, in uh, academia within my uh, university bubble and to see, some of these, uh, to see some of these designs get rolled out and sold is, is very exciting. So uh, I can provide more information on that in, uh, in another time. 
So there's some lessons learned, obviously, from, uh, from this accident, as there should be from any accident. Um, what can we learn from it? How can we um, apply this to, uh, to the future, to, to, to hopefully to avoid future accidents? Um, in one sense, as I wrote in the paper, we wrote in the paper, it's classic. It's, it's, it's an old story. It's complex. Uh, there's multiple contributor factors, operations, procedures, new technologies, different levels of automation, poor design, blah, blah, blah. We've seen it for decades. And we can continue to see it in different applications today. Following Mac 8, I mentioned that once, it's a classic example. What else we have? Autonomous driving is a very public and uh, uh, relevant example. And these are kind of uh, issues involved in, in both of those examples and, and others. So that's one aspect of this paper, but actually it's, uh, it's more in the organizational aspect of how we ended up with this design. Uh, in this case and, and in, in, in the merchant world, which I'm certainly more familiar with. And I wanted to leave you with a quote because it really sums up, um, really sums up my area, my research area and, and where I work. And it comes from the United States Fleet Force Command Group. If a thorough human factors assessment, land-based testing, and design qualifications are considered too expensive or time-consuming, which is the first cross against my domain from uh, from uh, implementation perspective, it costs too much. I don't know really know what my return on investment would be, and uh, I, uh, we'll stop implementation right at the beginning. Won't we'll even consider it. But if it's considered too expensive, too time-consuming, then modernization of these control systems should not be undertaken. At I think that's a really powerful statement um, that was relevant in 1950s aviation development as it is today, unfortunately. So, so, um, so I'll leave you with that.